All right, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening for wherever you are. Greetings from Indonesia and Indo Anesthesia. So this afternoon, Jakarta time, Perdatin Jaya and the Department of Anesthesiology and Intensive Therapy, FKWI RSCM, uh, we will uh, celebrate or we will uh, conduct a webinar regarding, I think this is quite familiar drug. Uh, I think everyone already knows it as a lidocaine. So the title of today's webinar is Lidocaine uh, Revisited, New Insights for Perioperative Use. And I would like to thank uh, PT Mitsubishi Pharma Tanabe Indonesia for their continued support for this webinar. For today's webinar, we have two prominent speakers. For the first one is Dr. Mark Boucher from France. Hello. And the second speaker, I think everyone already knows him. Uh, this is our Dr. Susila Chandra from Indonesia. And for today's webinar, it will be led by Dr. Aino Nindya Awerkari from Indonesia. Please, Dr. Aino, you may start. Thank you very much, Dr. Krisha, for your kind introduction. As you say, um, lidocaine, I don't think it's a new drug. In fact, it's an age-old drug for a lot of us. It's a drug that we see uh, for in a lot of medical practice and not only anesthesia, but I think most of us is more familiar with its local anesthetic properties. So we aren't used to using it uh, perioperatively, intravenously, even though there is growing evidence that it's very beneficial and not only for its analgesic effects. So today we have two Speakers, Phil Esther Marlossier, thank you very much for coming here. Oh. Hello, we are very happy to see you. Uh, we are, we have seen a lot of your work all over in the internet regarding lidocaine use, and I think it will be very interesting to see uh, your perspective about this. And later in the afternoon here in Jakarta time, we will also have Dr. Susilo Chandra giving his special perspective for lidocaine use in neurosurgery. So without further ado, I would like to uh, invite our first speaker, Professor Marc Bossier, to start with your presentation. Please, the time is yours. Hello, everybody. Is it okay at the, the screen? You see my presentation? Yes. Yes, clearly. Okay. Thank you for uh, this uh, invitation. It's uh, a great pleasure and a great honor to be uh, among you this, uh, this afternoon. And um, I'm especially uh, uh, happy to, to talk about very interesting drugs, as you mentioned. Uh, before that's not really a new drug, but um, my purpose is to show you that uh, you can expect many benefits uh, by uh, using intravenous uh, lidocaine. Uh, it's not a new concept, as as you can see. As soon as in uh, uh, 1960, um, some uh, publication were uh, released uh, about the use of intravenous as an adjunct to general anesthesia. Uh, very old practice, but uh, this concept is uh, now coming back into fashion because uh, we know more and more, better and better this, uh, this drug. And this, uh, and you know that uh, that's a safe uh, uh, drug uh, uh, currently, you, you, we have to implement the enhance of uh, recovery after surgery program and to develop uh, decades of surgery and this drug as a place uh, in the, the, the strategies. Um, that's a reflection in uh, European, but uh, Surely in uh, Indonesian too, uh, about the use of opiate free uh, anesthesia and lidocaine can be very helpful in this, um, uh, in this concept. And um, finally, 
uh, probably, as uh, I will show you uh, uh, after, uh, the use of IV lidocaine could uh, be uh, beneficial to prevent uh, chronic postoperative pain, which is a very, very uh, important problem after uh, surgery. Uh, as, my, as I mentioned before, lidocaine has many interesting properties in the perioperative uh, setting. Obviously, you know that uh, that's an analgesic drug and above all, an anti-hyperalgesic drug. That's very uh, important. But you can expect to have additional uh, benefits. Lid IV lidocaine has um, uh, uh, activity on uh, bronchial reactivity that, that prevents uh, bronchial uh, reactivity. Obviously, cardiovascular properties, anti-thrombotic uh, effect. Uh, it's well demonstrated that IV lidocaine in has a, a beneficial effect on the digestive tract and uh, resumption of um, gastric ileus after abdominal surgery. Antimicrobial, anti-tumoral effect and you will see that uh, probably in the, the next future, um, it, it becomes one of uh, a very uh, interesting property for using IV lidocaine and anti-inflammatory effect. Even if the mechanism of action, of action is uh, still largely unknown, uh, the, the, these drugs um, interact with um, uh, many uh, channel and uh, uh, many intracellular uh, communication uh, link uh, to uh, display these uh, properties. Well, the, the question is, um, how can it, uh, can it be possible for um, this drug, which is very, which looks very interesting, to be still underused in uh, many countries. I think so, that's a problem in Indonesia, but uh, that's a problem in France too. Uh, the the, the IVL lidocaine is still underused. Um, let me let let me show you some probably some explanation. Probably a sufficient knowledge of potential benefits. And uh, I will try to, um, uh, to address uh, this, uh, these properties. Probably a state of confusion is, a, is arising from scientific uh, literature and especially from meta analyses, uh, which are um, very heterogeneous uh, and uh, uh, sometimes very confused because, as you will see, IV uh, lidocaine is, uh, is not efficient in all uh, model of uh, surgery. Probably also a poor knowledge of uh, pharmacologic uh, properties and uh, that make physician a little bit afraid to um, uh, uh, to use uh, IV lidocaine. The fear of side effect and probably one of the major problem is that the off-label use of uh, this, uh, these drugs. And you will see that this is um, uh, currently uh, not really uh, um, uh, still a problem uh, because um, uh, company, uh, pharma pharmaceutical company um, uh, develops uh, new uh, conditioning about uh, the drug to allow uh, safe uh, intravenous use. And probably uh, another problem is the competition with uh, other local regional analgesia. And because uh, you have to uh, put attention on maximal dose of local anesthetic, it's sometimes difficult to combine IV administration and uh, local uh, anesthetics, uh, local regional 
analgesia. And this probably is a problem. Let me start with uh, this kind of randomized control study. Uh, there is a huge amount of uh, paper about uh, in the interest of uh, uh, IV lidocaine. I, uh, I have selected this one coming from a Belgian team uh, to show what you can expect uh, by using IV lidocaine for laparoscopic colectomy. Uh, as compared to, to control group, patients that have received IV lidocaine have less uh, pain score, both at rest and mobilization. Uh, opiate consumption was uh, also uh, reduced and significantly uh, reduced, but um, you can have additional uh, benefit on post-operative course and recovery. Patients uh, having intravenous lidocaine have less post-operative uh, fatigue. Uh, and um, above all, the, the post-operative recovery was accelerated with uh, uh, a, a resumption, uh, a shorter time of uh, gastric ileus after surgery. Resumption of uh, gastric function was uh, uh, occurred sooner. And um, this, the, 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 this translates into this allowed for a reduction in hospital C, which, which is uh, very short in the group that have received uh, lidocaine. Both differences were statistically uh, significant. Um, all of this paper uh, can be put together in a meta-analysis. This is a, re a recent um, meta-analysis and uh, showing a beneficial effect on uh, pain relief, both at rest and coughing. Uh, during the first uh, post-operative uh, days, the first 24 hours after uh, surgery, um, the, uh, the, the, the resumption of uh, uh, gastric ileus uh, was statistically uh, um, faster uh, after uh, lidocaine that than uh, after uh, control. Um, morphine requirement were reduced, but this did not reach the, the, the threshold of the statistical significance in this uh, meta-analysis. But as you can see, the length of hospital stay was significantly re reduced uh, in this uh, meta-analysis, putting together 10, uh, 10 studies. Uh, this is the reason why uh, the use of intravenous uh, IV lidocaine is presently uh, recommended by international society. Uh, you know the, the European International Society prospect, uh, which released uh, recommendation on uh, pain management for all kinds of surgery. And as you can see in this slide, intravenous lidocaine uh, by a bolus uh, injection followed by continuous in uh, injection throughout the, uh, <coughs> the, the period of the surgery is uh, clearly recommended. This is also uh, the case for uh, uh, in France, uh, in my country, for the French Society of Anesthesiologists. And, and uh, you know that uh, this suggests that the use of uh, intravenous uh, lidocaine, especially in patients who do not benefit from regional anesthesia, is highly uh, recommended for uh, abdominal, pelvic, or uh, spinal uh, surgery. But uh, IV lidocaine is, uh, uh, the, the, the interest of IV lidocaine is not restricted to uh, major surgery, not as illustrated by uh, this, uh, this paper. Lidocaine uh, 
could be IV lidocaine, uh, could be uh, also very interesting in a short duration procedure. And as I mentioned before, this could be uh, uh, really interesting in the setting of ambulatory surgery. This paper um, was carried out in a laparoscopic cholecystectomy and with an uh, initial bolus of 1.5 uh, mics per uh, kilogram, uh, followed by a continuous infection of, of two milligrams uh, per kilogram per hour. And uh, once again, uh, that's always the same uh, story. Uh, the pain was better alleviated in the lidocaine uh, group and uh, opioid uh, consumption was uh, reduced, uh, allowing the author to conclude that lidocaine is a safe, inexpensive and uh, very interesting strategy to improve the quality of recovery, even after short duration procedure performed in ambulatory uh, surgery. This is once again emphasized in this uh, meta-analysis uh, putting together all the paper uh, carried out in a laparoscopic uh, cholecystectomy, that's five randomized control uh, trials showing that the use of lidocaine allowed for a reduction in pain intensity at the 24 uh, hour after surgery, and uh, as well as a reduction in postoperative opiate uh, consumption. But uh, as, uh, as I say um, uh, before, uh, there is still controversies about the interest of IV lidocaine in some uh, kind of surgery, such as uh, orthopedic surgery. This is a paper from a, a French team showing that the administration of uh, IV uh, lidocaine um, wasn't effective uh, in, uh, in this uh, setting. And this may explain that uh, meta-analysis putting together all kinds of surgery um, uh, conclude to, to some disappointing and or controversial um, uh, effect. But uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the, the, the interest, the, the, the beneficial effect of IV lidocaine was clearly demonstrated in uh, abdominal, uh, thoracic, and a lot of uh, other surgery. Probably a little bit disappointing in uh, orthopedic surgery, but this remains probably to be uh, uh, demonstrated. Um, this uh, this is not uh, similar for spine surgery, and you can see on this slide uh, a very uh, recent uh, meta-analysis ex exploring the, 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 the beneficial effect of IV lidocaine on the spine after spine uh, surgery, and you can see that uh, uh, the, the, the pain score during the, the first 24 hours after surgery were significantly reduced after uh, uh, the use of uh, lidocaine. Um, as I told before, lidocaine has other beneficial effect than pure analgesic uh, effect. And uh, um, I, will show, uh, I will show you some, uh, some slide illustrating that you can expect to have other beneficial effect by using uh, lidocaine. Obviously, um, analgesic effects are the most uh, demonstrated effect and uh, uh, presently and uh, the, the mechanism are uh, uh, well uh, known and demonstrated. And you can see that uh, uh, local anesthetic, IV local anesthetic uh, may act at uh, uh, throughout the, uh, uh, the transmission, the, the, the pathway of uh, nociceptive uh, transmission at peripheral, but also central level 
of uh, transmission. But probably most importantly are the anti-hyperagesic effects of intravenous lidocaine. In this, uh, in this study, performed in, uh, in human uh, skin with a little uh, uh, skin incision of four millimeter, uh, pa uh, patients that uh, uh, voluntary uh, LC uh, patients, uh, the use of um, IV lidocaine uh, reduces, as expected, reduces the, uh, the pain induced by these uh, little incisions. But above all, uh, lidocaine displayed a powerful prevention of hyperagesia. And you can see that the secondary hyperagesia and the flare um, surrounding the, uh, the, the uh, incision was significantly reduced by the use of IV lidocaine. And this could, perhaps, this could explain uh, that um, some beneficial effect on IV lidocaine and chronic residual postoperative pain uh, could be uh, expected. Uh, in this uh, uh, meta-analysis uh, performed on patients uh, that have breast uh, surgery, and you know that in this uh, setting, the occurrence of, uh, post uh, of uh, chronic residual postoperative pain is really a big problem. And uh, uh, as uh, shown, uh, in this uh, in this slide, the benefit the, the the effect the effect of IV uh, lidocaine on pain is uh, quite moderate, but but uh, patients that have received IV lidocaine had uh, less risk of residual postoperative post pain, and this is probably very uh, interesting. Um, Additional property, uh, uh, probably very interesting in the setting of opiate-free anesthesia is the fact that IV lidocaine reduces intraoperative hypnotic, hypnotic requirement. This is uh, clearly shown for international uh, agent. You can see um, a reduction of approximately one third of uh, uh, allogenated uh, requirement, but uh, this is also obviously this is this had, uh, has also been demonstrated for propofol and uh, propofol requirement. But uh, probably most importantly, um, uh, se uh, several uh, uh, paper uh, clearly showed that uh, uh, in the combination of intravenous li lidocaine. Uh, with uh, um, uh, opiate and uh, in this paper with uh, sulfentanil allowed for a reduction uh, of the uh, opiate requirement during the surgery and uh, at, at the same level of uh, the same depth of, uh, of uh, anesthesia. And this is probably very interesting. Another property uh, is uh, uh, the, the ability for IV lidocaine to reduce and to control bronchial uh, reactivity. And this is uh, uh, show, this, this has been clearly demonstrated for a very long time. You can see in this paper from uh, uh, 1980 uh, that uh, this is a, an animal study and uh, bron uh, bronchial reactivity was uh, elicited by uh, citric uh, acid uh, administration. And you can see that uh, the IV lidocaine at the usual plasmatic uh, concentration, IV lidocaine allowed for um, a, a, a decrease in uh, bronchial reactivity uh, in resistance, in bronchial resistance, as well as uh, uh, ventilatory compliance, which, which was uh, uh, better preserved in the patients that have received 
uh, lidocaine. And this probably is very interesting. Same results have been obtained uh, in, uh, in a human. Uh, this is a, 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 a paper uh, designed in, uh, in, uh, in patient. Uh, bronchial irritation was induced by saline uh, application and IV lidocaine allowed for uh, a, 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 a clear uh, reduction of expiratory reflex, inspiratory blockage, and cough. Uh, only apnea uh, was uh, not reduced by uh, the use of uh, IV lidocaine, but otherwise you see that uh, uh, all the bronchial reflex uh, were um, uh, 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 significantly uh, better improved by the use of uh, IV uh, lidocaine. And this is a, a recent uh, meta-analysis showing that uh, at, the, at the range of uh, usual common use uh, dose, um, uh, IV lidocaine uh, is able to decrease intubation and this induced uh, cough, extubation induced cough, and opioid induced cough. And this, this is probably very interesting, and uh, especially if uh, uh, you using a LMA, and, uh, and probably um, uh, this, this could have a, a, a very uh, clinical uh, pertinence. Um, I would like to show you that uh, uh, this uh, uh, the use of IV uh, lidocaine probably uh, has an anti-tumoral effect. And this, this uh, probably uh, will, will be one of uh, a major issue to use uh, IV uh, lidocaine in the future because of uh, uh, anti-inflammatory effect, direct effect on immune cell, direct effect apoptosis on a cancer uh, cell. Uh, lidocaine probably has the possibility uh, to, uh, to, have, to provide significant benefits in long-term cancer outcome. And this is uh, illustrated in, uh, in this uh, recent uh, retrospective study on patients that underwent pancreatectomy for pancreas cancer. And uh, as you can see in this slide, the overall uh, survival uh, after surgery was significantly improved in the patients uh, that have received IV lidocaine. And this, this is, that makes sense. And this is certainly uh, one of uh, a major um, uh, development for the use of IV lidocaine in the next uh, few years. I would like to um, uh, to have a look with uh, with you and uh, pharmacological uh, data uh, because probably one of the impediments to use IV lidocaine is the fear of um, of um, uh, side effect and the the the, uh, the, the fear of uh, of uh, the question. Uh, of how to use it uh, uh, correctly uh, to avoid a clinical problem. Just uh, a, a few uh, uh, statements about uh, uh, pharmacological uh, uh, data. Uh, lidocaine has a big comportmental pharmacokinetic uh, uh, model with um, uh, a, a very fast um, half-life of diffusion and uh, 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 rapid uh, elimination half time, which is between 80 and 110 uh, minutes. Liver extraction is uh, elevated. That makes the metabolic rate of uh, IV lidocaine enters the dependence of liver blood flow rather than of uh, liver enzymatic uh, property. Lidocaine is metabolized in, uh, 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 by a cytochrome in a monoethylglycine exilidide 
makes makes as a, um, approximately 18 percent of the uh, activity of the native drug only with a longer elimination half-life and probably uh, this could have some implication during long duration uh, administration which are not recommended really uh, the fixation protein fixation rates of the the product is uh, um, 60 uh, percent according to the uh, alpha one antiplasmine concentration and this uh, illustrates uh, metabolism of uh, uh, iv uh, lidocaine and you can see that less than 10 percent of uh, the product is directly eliminated, eliminated by the kinase. Uh, in, in practice, the, the usual range of concentration for analgesia purpose is between two and five mics uh, per, um, uh, per liter. And this, uh, you can see that uh, this range of concentration is uh, largely um, below the threshold of neurologic toxicity which are between eight and ten mics and uh, largely below the threshold of cardiac toxicity which are uh, very elevated uh, between uh, 15 and uh, 25 uh, mics by using a bolus of uh, 100 milligrams of uh, uh, IV lidocaine followed by a continuous infusion of two uh, milligrams per, uh, per minute, uh, you, have, uh, you can obtain um, uh, uh, plasmatic concentration uh, very close to two uh, mics uh, in concentrations that are uh, a very safe uh, concentration. And this is illustrated uh, in this uh, study where um, author um, measured the, the lidocaine after a bolus administration of 1.5 milligram per kilo followed by an infusion, a continuous infusion of 1.5 milligram per kilo per hour in LC uh, patient. And you can see that the concentration is always um, um, very close to uh, two, uh, two uh, mics. And, uh, and once the infusion was discontinued, uh, plasmatic concentration uh, decrease very uh, rapidly uh, after the, 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 the product has been uh, switched off. And uh, this, is, this clearly illustrates the safety of using this kind of uh, doses. Um, another uh, studies uh, measured the lidocaine concentration, as, as you can see in this slide, both of the study using um, almost similar uh, regimen of administration that's uh, 1.5 milligram per kilo uh, uh, as a bolus followed by a continuous infusion. Uh, most of the st study um, uh, found, found uh, similar uh, concentration very close to two mics. That is the uh, therapeutic range of this product to obtain analgesic results. Just a few uh, words um, on uh, two specific population. Um, uh, first of all, elderly patients, you know that uh, elderly patients have an increase in elimination half-life uh, of uh, lidocaine, an increase in the distribution uh, volume without modification in plasmatic uh, clearance. And uh, uh, this uh, uh, is illustrated in, uh, in, this, uh, in this picture. And uh, uh, the conclusion is that you can use the same bolus uh, in elderly patients as <coughs> in uh, young uh, patients, but you have to, uh, to be careful about uh, the dose of continuous infection, uh, infusion that um, 
that have to be uh, that has to be reduced by approximately one third in this uh, patient. This is exactly uh, the the same concept for obese uh, patient. Obese patient has an elimination half life that is uh, clearly uh, increased uh, as contrast to non obese uh, patients. Uh, the bolus. Uh, should be based on a true uh, weight and the infusion should be based on ideal body uh, weight, probably, probably with a reduction of the dose uh, of uh, continuous uh, inf uh, infusion. This is a, a recent paper from uh, uh, an Indian uh, team uh, where uh, the, the IV uh, lidocaine uh, was uh, infused, um, was continuing continuously uh, infused uh, during uh, three days, and after three days of uh, administration, even in uh, one milligram per kilo per hour or two milligram per kilo per hour, in um, young and elderly patients in uh, obese and uh, non-obese uh, patients, you can see the safety of these drugs after discontinuation, the, there is no accumulation of uh, the, the drugs. And uh, after discontinuation, uh, elimination rate was very uh, fast. And above all, uh, very predictable that makes uh, IV lidocaine uh, safe uh, profile. Um, this is further um, underlined by the result of this uh, uh, meta-analysis that I, I show you uh, before uh, in uh, uh, 300 patients there was only one case of local anesthetic toxicity, which is very mild or moderate in nature with only metallic test and, uh, and tinnitus. And it was uh, probably um, a, 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 a mistake in, uh, in a drug uh, doses. But uh, this uh, illustrates the safety of the drug. And uh, once again, in the Cochrane, uh, this uh, Cochrane delivery, um, in uh, uh, all, all, all kind of uh, surgery, you see, including more than uh, uh, 1,000 uh, uh, patients with bolus between one and two uh, milligram per kilo and effusions between one to five milligram per kilo per hour, no side effect relating to lidocaine uh, administration uh, was, um, uh, was mentioned. And this, uh, uh, even if the, the proof of, of evidence by the Cochrane group was considered a, as very uh, low, uh, this illustrates the safety profile of, uh, of the, the drug uh, when, when uh, using at the usual recommended dose, that means between 1 and 1.5 milligrams per kilogram bolus, followed by uh, a continuous infusion of 1 to 1.5 milligram per, per kilo per hour. Uh, let me now. Uh, addressed the, the, uh, the problem of the off-label use and uh, of uh, this drug. And um, uh, it's, uh, it's really a, a, a problem to, to administer a drug uh, with the, a specific mention of, uh, of the bottle, like uh, not for um, uh, intravenous use. But as uh, as mentioned before, this is only a problem of marketing and of uh, conditioning of uh, uh, of the, the solution. And pharmaceutical company uh, have not a request for uh, the uh, authorization to to give 
uh, these products intravenously, and this can explain uh, this kind of uh, restriction. And as, as you can see in this slide, uh, we have now a formulation of uh, lidocaine uh, clearly uh, mentions that uh, this is for injectable um, uh, way and uh, you know that uh, uh, on this um, uh, xylocard is a formulation for uh, cardiac administration of uh, xylocaine. This is clearly mentioned that uh, this solution is intended for uh, uh, injectable of an, an intravenous use. First of all, uh, it uh, can be argued that uh, the indication for postoperative analgesia, illicit resumption, prevention of propofol induced pain have been largely documented in the literature. And this, uh, this is very uh, uh, meaningful uh, to uh, use this, uh, this product. This product. International guidelines make clear recommendation about the use of uh, IV lidocaine for abdominal surgery. We have now intravenous formulation lablet for cardiac use, <coughs> that's uh, xylocard, uh, which uh, do not lead to any problem when administered intravenously. <coughs> and uh, um, authorization have been obtained for several new uh, formulation. We have new formulation in, uh, in uh, Europe, uh, clearly mentioning that uh, 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 lidocaine can be administer, administered intravenously. In conclusion, uh, IV uh, lidocaine is a well tolerated dose uh, at, the, at, uh, at those commonly uh, used with a large therapeutic index. Its beneficial analgesic effects have been clearly demonstrated, especially after abdominal surgery, digestive, urologic, uh, gynecologic surgery, even after short-term administration. Uh, that is not uh, really the case for orthopedic surgery and uh, uh, the results of after orthopedic surgery are a little bit controversial. Um, additionally to its analgesic benefits, uh, IV lidocaine can improve the postoperative recovery course uh, because uh, uh, it can reduce opiate consumption and accelerate uh, uh, the digestive uh, function. Probably additionally effects are of major interest such as the, the, the control of propofol induced relative pain or, and, or, or uh, the activity to prevent uh, bronchotracheal reactivity. And maybe uh, one of the major development of the drug will be based on long-term effect and probably the prevention of postoperative chronic pain, as well as the inhibition of tumoral recurrence. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope uh, to, uh, to, to, to have made a a, a, a clear presentation and to help you to use these very interesting drugs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Bautier. Um, throughout your presentation, we have accepted quite a number of questions in the Q&A box. Uh, it seemed that quite a number of the participants here have already themselves have experience in using IV lidocaine for a very operative use. We will discuss these questions a little bit later. Now we will hear first the presentation from Dr. Susila Chandra. I would like to invite Dr. Susila Chandra to give a presentation on uh, the specific perspective for neurosurgery and IV lidocaine use. The floor is yours, Dr. Cecilo. Thank you, I know. Uh, thank you for, for Mark Bousset to give us uh, everything that you know. As you may know, in, we are now starting to give uh, lidocaine intravenously for almost all, at least myself all case and let me speak in bahasa for my presentation but the slide will be in english
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Selamat sore, salam sejahtera Kalau teman-teman sejawat semua mengikuti <coughs> Saya sejak Agustus 2020 Waktu itu kami menyelenggarakan uh, Webinar mengenai Enhanced Recovery After Surgery Kalau di total sampai hari ini Sudah enam kali kita menyelenggarakan webinar itu Sampai uh, pembicaranya itu perlu Makan undang setron dulu karena sudah jenuh betul ya Walaupun ternyata sambutannya terus-terus menerus rame Karena ini hal yang menarik, sesuatu yang baru Dan sebetulnya tidak istimewa tapi menarik karena kerjasama tim yang kuat dan Sampai saya pikir saya harus move on nih Mesti ada <coughs> pencerahan yang baru Jadi hari ini saya akan membahas lidokain intravena Karena lidokain intravena adalah suatu Hidden treasure, suatu harta karun yang kita sia-siakan selama ini. Kita tadi sudah dengar dari Prof. Busier bahwa banyak sekali manfaat yang bisa kita dapat pada macam-macam operasi. Digestif, ginekologi, breast, urologi, pada eh, kasus-kasus ambulatori anestesi. For this, I think I should thanks to Guru of Lidocaine, Prof. Mark Busey. Karena sampai hari ini, sebetulnya kita masih sedikit sekali pengetahuan mengenai peranannya di dalam neuroanestesi. Kebetulan tadi tidak disinggung, jadi kita bersyukur. Saya bersyukur dapat kesempatan di celah sempit itu untuk memberi, ingin mendiskusikan apakah lidocaine mempunyai tempat untuk digunakan pada neuroanestesi. Jadi outline pada hari ini adalah mekanismenya, kerjanya gimana, efek kliniknya gimana, dan safety. Mudah-mudahan waktunya nggak keburu-buru ya. Ternyata lidokain sebetulnya sudah pernah dicoba secara intravena dan mempunyai efek sistemik yang bermanfaat sudah sejak tahun 1950. 51. Namun karena obatnya murah, sehingga Industri farmasi tidak melihat keuntungan dari obat ini. Dan penelitian-penelitian efek sistemik lidokain sangat sedikit, apalagi di bidang neuroanestesi. Kita sekilas kembali mengenai protokol enhanced recovery after surgery. Kita lihat di tempat intraoperatif betapa pentingnya komponen opioid sparring anestesia. Dan di postoperatif komponen multimodal sparring opioid pain control yang bisa mendukung keberhasilan enhanced recovery after surgery konsep eras ini terutama konsep opioid sparring atau free, sur- free opioid surgery juga dapat diaplikasikan pada neuroanestesia mari kita lihat bagaimana mekanisme kerja lidokain setelah diinjeksikan trafena lidokain mencapai jaringan perifer dalam waktu 5-8 menit Berikatan di protein plasma sebanyak 60-80% Metabolisme terutama di hepar Eliminasi dalam waktu 80-110 menit Dan seluruhnya diekskresi melalui ginjal Lidokain bekerja pada berbagai tempat penjalanan nyeri Tadi sudah dijelaskan oleh Prof. Busye Dimulai dari transduksi, transmisi, modulasi Dari saraf perifer sampai susunan saraf pusat pada susunan secara pusat juga bekerja di banyak tempat, di reseptor muskarinik, nikotinik, glisirinergik, kanal natrium dan kalium, NMDA, serotonin, dan opioid. Jadi dapat dianggap obat satu ini bisa bersifat multimodal. Selain bersifat analgesia melalui modulasi nyeri, juga lidokain mencegah terjadinya nyeri kronik. Pembedahan seperti kita ketahui bersama merupakan stres yang berat buat pasien, ada respon inflamasi yang berlebihan terhadap terap operasi berdampak buruk pada pemulihan pasien. Lidokain intravena terbukti menekan respon inflamasi dengan mekanisme inhibisi aktivasi leukosit saat terjadi stimulus, menginhibisi TNF alfa dan menurunkan kadar sitokin inflamasi berpotensi bermanfaat dalam proses penyembuhan luka dan pemulihan. Bahkan tadi disinggung sedikit oleh Prof. Busye, mungkin suatu saat 
bisa juga bermanfaat untuk COVID-19 terapi. Sedang dalam penelitian saya lihat. Lidokain memiliki efek minimal terhadap depresi nafas sehingga menjadi agen tambahan untuk pasien yang memerlukan penekanan pada refleks jalan nafas, mencegah batuk sehingga bermanfaat pada pasien dengan tekanan intrakranial yang tinggi. Mari kita bahas kegunaannya pada neuroanestesia. Neuroanestesia memiliki kekhususan dibanding bidang-bidang lain dalam anestesi. Pada neuroanestesia dikatakan pengetahuan dan keterampilan seseorang dokter anestesi berpengaruh secara langsung terhadap outcome pasien. Mengingatkan lagi bahwa mengenai prinsip dasar dalam neuroanestesi adalah target kondisi operasi yang optimal, erat kaitannya dengan relaksasi otak, menjaga dan mempertahankan tekanan perfusi serebral dengan perkataan lain mencegah cedera sekunder dan menjaga oksigenasi serebral. Menghasilkan kondisi operasi yang optimal dan mencegah cedera sekunder perioperatif tidak dapat terlepas dari pembahasan mengenai tekanan intrakranial dan faktor-faktor yang mempengaruhinya. Sangat banyak komponen ini yang berada di bawah kontrol dokter anestesi pada saat operasi. Pada presentasi ini saya akan berfokus pada pengaruh laju metabolisme otak yang dapat mempengaruhi aliran darah, volume darah, dan pada akhirnya mempengaruhi tekanan intrakranial. Metabolisme otak ini juga menjadi perhatian pada konsep neuroprotektif. Pada gambar yang sebelah kiri kita lihat secara umum 60% metabolisme otak digunakan untuk fungsi elektrofisiologi. 40% nya untuk mempertahankan integritas membran sel. Agen anestesi menurunkan cerebral motorbike rate melalui penurunan fungsi elektrofisiologi dengan depresi maksimal penurunan 60% dengan dosis barbiturat pada koma barbiturat. Gambar kanan menggambarkan penurunan lebih jauh dari cerebral metabolic rate dapat terjadi pada pasien dengan hipotermi karena dapat menurunkan energi untuk mempertahankan integritas membran sel dan perlu diingat bahwa barbiturat koma dan hipotermi punya efek samping yang berat. Lidokain bermanfaat bahkan saat induksi karena kita sering menggunakan saya kira ya bisa mencegah nyeri saat penyuntikan e, propofol sehingga juga berguna untuk mencegah peningkatan tekanan intrakranial dan lonjakan hemodan dinamik saat laringoskopi dan intubasi apabila diberikan 3 menit sebelum laringoskopi. Dengan lidokain dari penelitian tekanan intrakranial hanya meningkat 1 sampai 3 mm air raksa dibanding dengan kontrol bisa meningkat sampai 26 mm air raksa. Normalnya tekan terkenal di bawah 15. Terjadi karena pencegahan batuk dan lonjakan hemodinamik yang tinggi saat laringoskopi dan intubasi. Jadi gunanya cukup banyak dimulai dari saat induksi. Lidokain juga bermanfaat untuk mencegah cedera sekunder akibat peningkatan tekanan intrakranial pada saat pemasangan pin kepala. Tekanan intrakranial dapat meningkat hingga 30 mm raksa bila respon terhadap stimulus pin kepala tidak dikontrol. Kontrol terhadap stimulus dapat menggunakan scalp block atau dengan bolus 3 mg e, bolus lidokain 3 menit sebelum pemasangan pin kepala. Atau bisa juga menggunakan lidokain intravena kontinu yang sudah dijalankan sebanyak induksi dengan bolus yang sebelum induksi. Jadi sudah mencapai dosis terapeutik pada saat pemasangan pin. Neuroprotektif didefinisikan sebagai pengobatan atau treatment yang diinisiasi sebelum terjadinya iskemik. Bertujuan untuk memodifikasi respon seluler terhadap berkurangnya suplai energi sehingga meningkatkan toleransi sel terhadap iskemia. Hipotesis sejak puluhan tahun bahwa agen anestesia yang bersifat neuroprotektif bekerja dengan menurunkan neurotransmisi sehingga menurunkan demand energi dan menjaga kesetimbangan energi selama terjadi gangguan supply. Efikasi dari neuroprotektif bergantung pada keparahan kerusakan sel saraf. Bila kerusakan sangat besar atau sangat berat hingga menyebabkan hilangnya seluruh aktivitas listrik, agen anestesi tidak bermanfaat lagi. 
Lidokain melalui penghambatan pada kanal natrium dapat menurunkan demand energi dengan dua mekanisme. Yang pertama, menurunkan aktivitas elektrik sehingga menurunkan konsumsi oksigen dan glukosa. Yang kedua, berefek pada stabilisasi membran dengan merestriksi aliran keluar masuk ion natrium dan kalium dan sehingga menurunkan energi untuk transport aktif kanal natrium KATPase dan menurunkan energi untuk mempertahankan integritas membran. Efek lidokain ini menyupai efek hipotermia. Dapat menurunkan lebih rendah dari 10 sampai eh, 15 sampai 20% dibanding penurunan karena barbiturat. Efek samping lidokain terhadap stabilitas hemodinamik seperti kita ketahui jauh lebih sedikit dan durasinya lebih pendek dibandingkan barbiturat. Selain mencegah peningkatan tekanan intrakranial pada kondisi stimulus noxious, lidokain juga dapat menurunkan tekanan intrakranial pada kondisi hipertensi intrakranial. Pada kondisi ini, lidokain sama efektifnya dengan tiopental dalam menurunkan tekanan intrakranial. De- dengan perubahan hemodinamik pada lidokain yang tidak signifikan berubah dibandingkan dengan pemberian tiopental yang menurunkan MAP secara signifikan sehingga ada kerugian pemberian tiopental dapat menurunkan cerebral perfusion pressure. Lidokain memiliki tempat pada kondisi hipertensi tekanan intrakranial yang tidak respon terhadap terapi-terapi lain. Pada studi yang menggunakan tikus percobaan yang dilakukan oleh Cem dan kawan-kawan tampak efek lidokain pada otak iskemik dengan outcome rata ukuran infak jauh lebih kecil pada 24 jam setelah onset iskemik. Lidokain dapat menurunkan kebutuhan energi, mendelay kekurangan energi dan menghambat influx ion natrium pada sel yang berada di inti iskemik pada periode hipoksia dan menghasilkan pemulihan energi ke kadar basal setelah reperfusi terjadi. Perfusi kalah iskemik pulih. Efek neuroprotektif lidokain yang tampak pada percobaan in vivo dan in vitro yang telah disiaran sebelumnya masih perlu diteliti lebih lanjut karena kita perlu yang skala besar tadi rata-rata penelitian dalam skala kecil. Sekali lagi karena lidokain low cost hal ini tidak terjadi karena sponsornya tidak ada. Jadi mesti kita sendiri yang membangkitkan penelitian ini. Pada saat ini hanya terbatas beberapa studi sampel kecil terlihat efek neuroprotektif berupa penurunan insiden POCD postoperatif. <tuh> neuroprotektif efek pada geriatrik usia di atas 65 ini menjalani operasi spine tanpa fungsi kognitif berdasarkan nilai MMSA pada kelompok lidokain lebih tinggi dibanding dengan kontrol. Dari lab diketahui marker inflamasi ALP6 dan marker brain injury lebih rendah pada kelompok lidokain. Diduga mekanisme neuroprotektif selain efeknya terhadap penurunan metabolisme oksigen di otak juga karena efek supresi pada respon inflamatori perioperatif. Pada pasien dengan traumatic brain injury yang berat umumnya memerlukan ventilasi terkendali secara secure airway dan uh, secure breathing. Tindakan intubasi pada kelompok pasien ini sangat riskan terjadi peningkatan tekanan intrakranial yang akan memperparah kondisi. Di sini lidokain dapat menumpulkan respon tersebut dan lonjakan hemodinamik. Namun pada pasien TBI berat seringkali pemberian obat anestesi menyebabkan hipotensi yang dapat menurunkan perfusi otak. Sehingga lidokain aman digunakan untuk intubasi pada TBI berat. dan teknik rapid sequence intubation karena tidak menimbulkan peningkatan tekanan darah maupun hipotensi. Penggunaan lidokain intravena kontinu intraoperatif dapat menurunkan kebutuhan akan obat anestesi inhalasi. Tadi sudah dijelaskan oleh Prof. Mark Busse bahwa bisa sampai sepertiganya, jadi sangat bermanfaat. Tapi apakah itu terjadi juga pada neuroanestesi nanti akan dibuktikan. Pada penelitian Kareles dengan lidokain 1,5 mg per kg berat badan bolus saat induksi dilanjutkan dengan maintenance 2 mg per kg berat badan per jam didapatkan hasil penurunan jumlah fentanil dengan placebo sebanyak 48,2% di luar biasa banyaknya berpotensi penurunan efek samping opioid setelah operasi utamanya ya. 
apalagi di era enhanced recovery after surgery hal ini menjadi hal yang penting lidokain intravena bermanfaat sebagai analgesia efeknya bisa bertahan hingga 8 jam setelah infus kontinu dihentikan pada penelitian ini tampak proporsi pasien dengan nyeri akut berat setelah operasi karenotomi supratentorial turun secara signifikan pada kelompok lidokain pada grafik proporsi pasien tanpa nyeri lebih tinggi dibanding eh, nol dibanding lidokain. Jadi lidokain sangat menguntungkan pada kasus-kasus ini. Yang juga perlu kita ketahui bahwa kalau kita memberi lidokain haruslah dimulai dengan bolus. Karena kalau kita langsung memulai dengan pemberian drip atau infus kontinu maka eh, terapeutik eh, level plasmanya itu baru terjadi setelah 3 sampai 4 jam. Jadi umumnya inilah dosis-dosis yang dianjurkan yaitu pada inisial bolus diberikan 1 sampai 3 mg per kilogram berat badan, umumnya sih 1 setengah mg per kilogram berat badan intravena bisa diberikan 30 menit sebelumnya karena bisa mem- memperbaiki resiko kalau ada intubasi yang tidak smooth. Dan maintenance-nya bisa dari 1 sampai 5 mg per kilogram berat badan per jam, umumnya hanya 2 mg per kilogram berat badan per jam. Bisa dihentikan setelah jahitan kulit tapi kalau diperlukan untuk postoperatif pun obat ini sangatlah menguntungkan pada operasi dengan komponen nyeri neuropatik yang cukup besar seperti mastektomi umumnya preoperatif pasien sudah memiliki nyeri kronik karena infiltrasi tumor dosis maintenance lidokain umumnya perlu lebih tinggi jadi bisa diberikan 3 mg per kilogram berat badan per jam dan dapat dilanjutkan dengan dosis 0,6 mg per kilogram berat badan per jam postoperatif kalau perlu sampai 35 hari. Bagaimana dengan keamanan? Tadi sudah dijelaskan panjang lebar oleh Prof. Mark Buse. Jadi umumnya tidak pernah tercapai dosis toksik pada terapeutik eh, anjuran rekomendasi. Jadi saya pikir eh, ini tidak dibahas terlalu banyak karena sudah dijelaskan bahwa dos- dosis yang pada dosis terapeutik yang direkomendasi umumnya hanya rentang 1 sampai 5 mikrogram per mililiter kalau dosis toksik neurologik sampai 15 kalau kardiovaskular toksik sampai 21 mg per mikrogram per mililiter jauh di atas dosis rekomendasi umumnya efek sampingnya terjadi karena kesalahan dosis hati-hati pemberiannya atau kesalahan setting syring spam jadi betul-betul berhitung dengan baik pada RCT ini kita lihat sampel yang mengalami kraniotomi supratentorial bahwa pemberian didokain kontinu interoperatif tidak menurunkan fungsi kognitif 24 jam post-op hingga 6 bulan post-operatif nah ini saya dan dokter Priambodo dan dokter Andi Omega melakukan penelitian double blind RCT tentang efek didokain intravena kontinu pada pasien yang menjalani operasi karenotomi untuk pengangkatan tumor. Sampelnya berjumlah 60, usia 18 sampai 65 dengan kesadaran sebelum operasi GCS 15. Subjek di random menjadi dua kelompok. Kelompok pertama lidokain intravena kontinu, kelompok kedua placebo menggunakan NaCl 0,9%. Pasien dokter analisis sebagai pengumpul data dan operator bedah saraf sebagai penilai outcome tidak mengetahui randomisasi dan intervensi yang diberikan. Selain intervensi di dokain dan placebo, maintenance anestesi seperti biasa kita lakukan, sifofluran 0,8 sampai 1 mg, fentanyl intermittent sesuai kebutuhan, masker relaksan kontinu, manitol diberikan pada dosis setengah gram per kilogram berat badan 30 menit sebelum operator bedah saraf mencapai dura mater. PASO2 dipertahankan 30 sampai 35 mm raksa. Berdasarkan penelitian ini, ini penelitian pertama rasanya ya yang membandingkan efek lidokain terhadap relaksasi otak intraoperatif. Total fentanyl intraoperatif dicatat dan kepuasan ahli bedah juga dinilai pada akhir operasi. Setelah dilakukan randomisasi dan lokasi subjek, tidak ada perbedaan secara statistik kedua kelompok. Jadi dapat dilakukan tidak ada bias. Setelah dilakukan analisis statistik, terdapat peningkatan bermakna secara statistik dalam ini proporsi relaksasi otak baik setelah pembukaan dura mater 
pada kelompok lidokain yaitu 96,7 persen dibandingkan dengan kelompok placebo 70 persen. Relaksasi otak, otak ini dinilai oleh operator bedah saraf dengan inspeksi langsung dan juga palpasi. Menggunakan empat skala relaksasi, relaksasi otak yang baik berarti otak di bawah atau pada tingkat dura skala 1 dan 2. Seperti penjelasan sebelumnya, lidokain dapat menurunkan cerebral metabolic rate oksigen dan cerebral blood flow sehingga menurunkan ICV, ICP yang dapat meningkatkan relaksasi yang baik. Lidokain bersifat analgesik pada penelitian ini, lidokain dapat menurunkan konsumsi fentanil intraoperatif hingga 400 mikrogram dan berbana betul secara klinik maupun statistik. Temuan ini penting dalam konsep opioid sparing anestesia atau surgery dan mengurangi efek samping terkait opioid postoperatif. Dalam studi kami, kita juga membaca profil hemodinamik yang relatif lebih stabil dibanding kelompok lido, pada kelompok lidokain, terutama pada dalam stimulus noxious maksimal seperti intubasi, ekstubasi, fiksasi headpin, insisi kulit. Hal ini terjadi melalui mekanisme analgesik dan menumpulkan refleks ketika intubasi dan noxious stimulus. Bagaimana dengan surgeon satisfaction? Kami menggunakan empat skala kepuasan secara umum sangat puas sehingga sangat tidak puas. Tampak lidokain meningkatkan proporsi operator yang puas 96,7 persen dibanding dengan placebo sebanyak 70 persen. Dan ini juga bermakna secara statistik. Kami menilai kepuasan operator selama operasi sangat dipengaruhi oleh kepuasan atau kualitas relaksasi otak. Yang juga penting tidak ada efek samping yang ditemukan akibat pemberian intravenous lidokain dalam penelitian kami semua pasien yang diberikan lidokain kesadarannya komposmentis telah dilakukan ekstubasi apakah bermanfaat lidokain tentu saja bermanfaat pada neuroanestesi karena memiliki efek neuroprotektif menurunkan tekanan intrakranial mencegah penekanan tekanan kranial pada saat stimulus noxious yang maksimal menurunkan kebutuhan agen inhalasi dan opioid intraoperatif sehingga berperan dalam balance anestesia dan menurunkan kejadian nyeri akut yang hebat post-op lidokain aman untuk digunakan pada neuroanestesia karena dari penelitian terbukti tidak menurunkan fungsi kognitif pasca operasi saya kira itu yang ingin saya sampaikan terima kasih atas perhatian teman-teman semua saya kembalikan ke dokter Aino Baik, terima kasih banyak Dr. Susilo atas presentasinya. Sangat menarik, terutama penelitian yang terakhir ya dok, itu mm -hmm. uh, sesuatu yang baru banget buat kita. Uh, surgeon satisfaction ternyata terpengaruh juga dengan kita menggunakan uh, intravena uh, lidocaine. Okay, so we will move on to the discussion session. We have a lot of questions coming in. Uh, there are some questions from senior anesthesiologists. We would like to thank you, Professor Darto, Darto Sartoto. Thank you for joining us. Dr. Atmar, thank you for joining us. Dr. Arif Marsaban, thank you for joining us. I think we will start with the first question. And this can be answered by uh, both uh, speakers. From Professor Darto, uh, how much IV lidocaine can induce um, cardiac uh, arrhythmia? I think this also implies bradyarrhythmia arrhythmia or bradycardia. So uh, I think this goes to question, uh, is there a dose that we should uh, stay away from? What is the maximum dose? And given that in, um, in regional anesthesia, sometimes we mix lidocaine with adrenaline. Uh, what do you think is the practice uh, with IV lidocaine? Is there a place for it? Uh, Please, I would like to know your comments on this. We can start with Professor Bossier, please. Thank you very much. Um, and congratulations to, to Cecilo for this excellent uh, presentation. Um, the, the question about uh, the, the, the cardiac um, properties of uh, lidocaine is out of the scope because um, uh, dose, dose is commonly used uh, for cardiac, for the reduction of uh, cardiac arrhythmias are largely upper than those uh, uh, for uh, analgesia. 
and uh, there is a, um, a, a very large margin of uh, safety because uh, between uh, the use of uh, IV lidocaine for analgesic purposes and uh, for uh, cardiac uh, arrhythmias. And uh, probably um, uh, the, the relationship between these two, two doses are between one to, to five fold or six fold the, the, the dose commonly used for analgesic purpose. There is no issue. Uh, the, the, uh, another question is, is about uh, the interest of uh, mixing adrenaline with, uh, with lidocaine. And uh, during IV uh, administration, there is absolutely no interest uh, of mixing uh, adrenaline. That, that could be a little bit dangerous because of, uh, of uh, hemodynamic um, repercussions. And it, it's uh, uh, it, it's not at all uh, uh, advisable. Okay. Uh, what is your thoughts on this, Dr. Susilo? Yeah, I think I have the same uh, answer that uh, for the lidocaine, usually uh, for the arrhythmia, bigger dose than we use for analgesia property. The second, we never use uh, adrenaline to add for IV it is dangerous so be careful when you uh, prepare the lidocaine in the syringe pump make sure that no adrenaline inside sometimes the the ampoule is just almost the same so be careful about that and yeah and some preparations i think is already like a pre-mixed um yeah with adrenaline we mm. should be careful mm. not to use those mixtures yes yes okay I think we can uh, also still regarding this, there is several questions. There is even one um, comment from Dr. Sakar here. She described her case, a geriatric patient, 80 years old with heart disease on beta blockers. And then she induced the patient and then the patient went into bradycardia up to 20, 20 something uh, beats per minute. And the surgery had to be postponed. Several other uh, participants also questioned this if you have a patient on beta blockers or if you have a patient whose baseline heart rate is low, can you still use lidocaine? What is your thought on this? Well, maybe we start with Professor Bossier. Uh, this is a, a very uh, pertinent uh, question. Um, probably um, uh, IV uh, lidocaine uh, should, should be used with very cautiously uh, in patients taking uh, beta blockers. And uh, especially in those uh, with uh, optimal uh, beta blocking uh, uh, effect with, uh, with a preoperative bradycardia, uh, you should use um, IV lidocaine with uh, very, very cautiously. That's probably uh, the, the addition of uh, IV lidocaine with other antiarrhythmic drug is probably uh, <clears throat> one of uh, uh, the, the only, um, not contraindication, but not recommendation uh, uh, use. Uh, and um, that, 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 could, that could be uh, uh, clinically problematic. Okay. Do you have an experience with this, Dr. Susilo? Mm, yeah, usually not use it if the, the patient is already on a beta blocker. Since yeah, we are we, we are afraid about possibility that the heart rate become d decrease. And the second question is about the use when the patient actually in normal uh, heart rate but low, like six, mm. 60. What do you suggest mark <laughs> like in athletes for example <laughs> no uh, I, I think the, the, the only uh, uh, restriction uh, is regarding the patients taking beta beta blocker or other anti arrhythmic drugs mm. but patients with 60 uh, uh, heart rate at uh, 16 uh, uh, at the preoperative level uh, it, it, it's not 
it is not really a problem. Lidocaine by itself uh, is not a radically uh, drug. Yeah. You, you have to know that. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. that's not only the combination uh, with other antiarrhythmic drugs that could be problematic. Maybe the okay. only thing that we should uh, mention about the contraindication of using ifilidocaine is AV block and okay. childhood C and also uh, chronic nerve failure on the end stage. Okay. And also beta blocker not recommended. Not no no. It is not contraindicated, but not recommended. Yes, very okay. important. Mm. That actually also uh, answer one of our uh, uh, participants' question here about the contraindication in end stage yeah. diseases. So better to avoid it, yeah. uh, even though the benefits could be a lot. Should you not have this condition? Mm. Uh, I think we can move on to the types of surgery which can benefit from IV lidocaine. Um, Professor Bosia mentioned a lot of types. Uh, Dr. Susilo highlighted its effect in neurosurgery, but is there like a tendency which kind of surgery will benefit most uh, given an IV lidocaine and which ones doesn't benefit? Uh, there's a question from Dr. Arif. He heard that he has read that laparoscopic surgeries has uh, better, uh, if you use lidocaine, the effect is better compared to laparotomies. So what is your take on this, Professor? I think the, the best indications are uh, uh, for uh, abdominal, thoracic, and probably neurosurgery. neurosurgery today, uh, today. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> I listened to the, to the talk by uh, Susilo. I am really convinced uh, to, to, <laughs> to do <laughs> for, it. <laughs> for neurosurgery. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, oh, oh. Every uh, surgery with an inflammatory component uh, are probably um, uh, good for, uh, for, for the use of uh, IV uh, uh, lidocaine. Uh, there is only controversy in orthopedic arthroplastic um, uh, surgery. But that's, that's um, uh, probably, uh, you talk about the interest about uh, on laparoscopic versus open uh, uh, laparotomy. Uh, probably that's important uh, in laparoscopy because uh, the um, peritoneal membrane is uh, uh, injured by the, the high pressure in abdominal compartment. And probably uh, IV uh, lidocaine um, as anti-inflammatory effect on the peritoneal uh, injury. And that's probably very important for postoperative outcome. Okay. Um, yes, Dr. Susilo. Yeah. I believe you've used this for orthopedic surgeries too. Yeah, what, yeah. What do you think <laughs> about this? Sama. So I think, Mark, about the orthopedic surgery, this is because the study is very limited. So yes. that's why because I did it every on every orthopedic surgery, uh, intra uh, preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperatively, then the need of opioid is much much less. So yeah, unluckily I'm not in a study, but just do it. But I think that it is also uh, useful for orthopedic surgery as well. Maybe you 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 are start to do the study with us. To yeah, wait, together. Why not? <laughs> Why not? Pleasure. Yeah. You you right, uh, I'm totally in accordance with uh, uh, with you. We we are lacking of uh, scientific proof about, about that. But uh, probably um, uh, another uh, condition uh, in orthopedic surgery uh, to use uh, IV lidocaine is patient taking opiate. Uh, preoperatively and, uh, and and probably in this patient, uh, uh, especially exposed to, uh, to 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 chronic pain and patients taking yeah. opioid preoperative period, 
probably it's important to, to use a combination of uh, ketamine, uh, lidocaine, and, and uh, it's, it, it, it remains a lot of uh, work to do, but uh, it was pleasure to, to do with this, uh, this yes. work together. Yes, it could be a very, very <laughs> good idea. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's a very interesting question from Dr. Oriza here. So say we do um, a regional anesthesia for cesarean section, he said. Um, is there any benefit for us to add intravenous lidocaine to supplement uh, our anesthesia practice? So we give regionals, but then you supplement with uh, IV lidocaine. Is this safe in cesarean section? Is it safe for the baby? Is it safe for breastfeeding? Uh, I think I will give uh, the floor first to Dr. Susilo since <laughs> you're an expert in obstetric yeah. anesthesia. Yeah. Please, Dr. Susilo. If I uh, answer in Bahasa Indonesia, is okay for you? Yes. Okay. okay. All in English, it's better. So you, you can also add something. I did it for all my cesarean section patients because it is benefit but after the baby is delivered give a bolus one and a half milligram per kilogram and then drip infusion continue till the surgery finish it has a very uh, unique effect it is have a sedative effect as well so the patient during surgery is a little bit yeah sleep not too deep but calm so and also if let's say our block is not that good lidocaine can help to yeah increase the the depth of analgesia during surgery what do you think mark <laughs> yes it's a, it's an interesting experience um uh, i think you you, you should be um, cautious with uh, the addition of uh, local regional uh, <coughs> anesthesia or local regional analgesia with uh, IV, IV uh, lidocaine. And um, uh, the, the benefit of combining both uh, are, are not clearly uh, demonstrated. You have always uh, while performing a local regional analgesia, we have always uh, a plasmatic resumption of, uh, of uh, the, the, the local anesthetic uh, drug, and it, it can be dangerous uh, uh, regarding the threshold of toxicity and the maximal recommended dose. Uh, it can be dangerous to combine IV lidocaine with other local regional analgesia. Okay, because I found one study in India that they 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 measured the uh, the depth of an uh, uh, like using bispectral index. They found when the patient has given one milligram out of one one five milligram bolus and then drip one milligram per kilogram per hour, the 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 beast is decreased to about 80 to 85. So it is also benefit for the sedative effect of the lidocaine. Yes. Okay, if I understand correctly, Dr. Susilo chose to do this after the baby is born, yeah, is that yeah. to prevent like placental transfer? Yeah, yeah, right, okay, right, right, right. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, we will move on to how uh, we practice um, giving intravenous uh, lidocaine. Uh, we have uh, a lot of practice in here uh, where you mix the lidocaine with the propofol. There's a question from the audience whether you can use this practice as part of your initial bolus. So you give 1.5 mil per kg within the propofol syringe. And isn't this like an off-label use? What is your thought on this, <laughs> Professor? Off-label <laughs> on off-label? <laughs> sure. No, no, you, you. <laughs> <laughs> you first. Um, yes, so 
the, the best time to uh, uh, to administer the bolus uh, is probably uh, at the, the, the time of uh, anesthetic induction. Uh, the best time is to do it probably before the propofol injection. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, there is um, a, a Cochrane recommendation showing that um, uh, mixing propofol with uh, a small dose of uh, uh, lidocaine is effective, but less effective than uh, injecting lidocaine before um, uh, propofol with uh, uh, 15 to 30 seconds of tonicate on, uh, uh, on the arm. In my opinion, um, uh, it's uh, the best way is. Uh, uh, is to, to provide the, the IV uh, lidocaine um, uh, just before the propofol injection at the, at the, the dose of uh, 1.5 uh, milligram per kilo. I cannot agree more. I cannot agree more. And we don't know the combination between lidocaine and propofol. Who knows? There what is something does, yeah. that we don't know. So it's. I'm in, yeah. not, not in favor of that. Yes. Okay. But the dose of the lidocaine for bolus and for maintenance in both your presentations, it can be quite varied depending on the study. We would like to know, like in your daily practice, what is your favorable dose? Do you have like <laughs> for this kind of surgery, a different dose, another type of surgery, a different dose? I would like to hear first from Dr. Susilo because this no, no, represents no. the digital population. From the, from the guru of Lidocaine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you do? I think we would very much like to know. <laughs> uh, usual practice is uh, it's uh, between one and, uh, and 1.5. Uh, Milligrams per uh, per kilo. Uh, I think I think I, I'm not sure about the benefit of uh, for analgesic purpose of uh, 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 of doing um, uh, larger dose, uh, and uh, um, probably that's uh, that's, that's a, a good a good combination between efficacy and uh, safety. A bolus of one to one point five, followed by continuous infusion of one to one point five milligrams per kilo per hour. <laughs> so I have a different opinion. <laughs> you use larger dose. Yeah, larger dose. I use one milligram for the bolus, and three milligrams per kilogram body weight for the maintenance. I found I I did like you one and a half for maintenance two. 2.5. Finally, I found three milligram is much stable. No need to give too much opioid after that. That's why. It is all still in the recommended dose, so I do it. Yes, yes, obviously that's that's uh, that's certainly a good uh, practice, but. Uh, uh, in my knowledge, uh, there is uh, no formal proof supporting yeah. the yeah. use of uh, 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 three rather than two uh, milligram per kilo per hour as an infusion. Uh, we are lacking of uh, of the data. Another another study that we can that we 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 could do uh, together. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Interesting. Please, and please take a note. No, I know. To study already. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe even more as the yeah, yeah. discussion after that, session after this. goes on. <laughs> um, okay, so say we give this infusion uh, and this surgery goes a long time, like in neuroanesthesia, maybe we can have like a 12 hour surgery. Do you think it's safe uh, for the patient, professor? Is there anything that we should like monitor uh, intraoperatively? Be cautious for. Yes, uh, it's probably it's safe at the usual recommended uh, dose. Uh, you have just to to be careful on a specific population. Uh, um, uh, Sushilo uh, uh, told uh, about. Uh, um, 
kidney insufficiency or uh, uh, liver insufficiency or elderly people or you you, you have to be careful about uh, um, prolonged continuous infusion in this uh, specific population so probably uh, reduce uh, the, 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 uh, the doses uh, infused 12 hours is not long i know because okay. you we, you can also infuse like five days for post-operative <laughs> pain <laughs> control pain. and it's also helpful no need to go to give opioid after that just combine with paracetamol and NS8, that would be... Is nice. it important to um, monitor the level of the drug in plasma if you use it for days like that? What do you think, Dr. Silo? Firstly, we don't have the... I, I don't think we do, we have a radiocaine test for that. Secondly, we already it's already become a common knowledge that recommended dose will be not exceed more than five micro per milliliter okay this also answer because there are several questions about mm. using this for post-operative pain and then the mm. patient goes toward if we yeah. should monitor anything specific but it should yeah. be yeah. a safe drug professor I, I believe you have a comment on this <laughs> yes sir. um the the only data we have on uh uh, uh perfusion limited to post-operative uh, period are uh, a little bit disappointing uh be probably because injury and inflammatory <coughs> sorry inflammatory state uh, have already been induced during the per the, the intraoperative period we did a, a study com comparing a local regional technique with the use of uh, uh, IV uh, lidocaine only during post-operative uh, period, not intraoperative. And uh, we did not find any benefit uh, of uh, using lidocaine, perhaps because the, 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 the dose was too, too low. But uh, uh, it's still under debate. For me, not, for me, it is not a debate anymore. Did <laughs> <laughs> you practice it? <laughs> tell us, tell us uh, your your experience, Cecilo. Yeah, I I give uh, one milligram per kilogram body weight for three days for my <laughs> own daughter. Big okay. surgery is a hemimandibulectomy with the uh, plastic surgery and it's helpful. The patient is very happy. He can know dizziness. The peristaltic of the bowel is very good. So, very the, the, this, is, this is the third, uh, the third study I think we should do. <laughs> this illustrates <laughs> yes. illustrate two things. One is uh, the safety of the drug administration of the margin, the very large margin of safety of these drugs. Mm -hmm. And uh, also that uh, uh, we have a lot of, uh, of work to do. We have still a lot of work to do with this. Yeah, drug. yeah, yeah. Because no pharmaceutical company help us to do it. We have to do it yeah. by ourselves. Yes, because it's, uh, it's very uh, cheap. <laughs> It's very cheap. It's not very expensive yeah, yeah. and not yeah. very financially uh, interesting. <laughs> and secondly, the pharmaceutical company that produce inhalation anesthesia will against us <laughs> because we reduce the dose in one third. <laughs> yes, I know. All right. Um... If we don't use it for post-operative, if it's like a simple one, two hour surgery and we want to stop the opioid, when do you think we should, uh, we want to stop the lidocaine, when do you think we should stop? One hour before, uh, exactly before extubation or do we continue like in the recovery room? We would like to know the experience of uh, Professor Bossier. When what? to stop the drip? Yes. Uh, one, uh, in, in our clinical practice, we stop uh, the administration of IV lidocaine at the end of the surgery, uh, after extubation. Uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, because 
there is also uh, a safety uh, issue. It's sometimes difficult to move the patients with, uh, uh, and yeah, it can, yeah. can be a little bit dangerous. And we are not uh, used to, um, uh, to this practice. And once again, uh, we have to talk about uh, uh, benefit and risk uh, ratio. And the, the benefit of uh, uh, prolonging the, uh, the infusion is not clearly demonstrated, but, and I consider um, that uh, uh, it's always uh, some, some risk to, to, to put IV lidocaine in the ward or uh, uh, where nurses yeah. are not, the, the, are not get very, used to do, yeah, yeah. It can be dangerous. Yeah. So yeah. we stop, but but perhaps it's wrong. We stop the continuous infusion at the end of the surgery. So, Silo. <laughs> is that also what you do, Dr. Silo? No, no. Sometimes I, I add it to, till the patient uh, removed to the ward. So in the okay. in the recovery room, I still give. Okay. For like, but not for one day surgery, for like uh, breast surgery, yeah, because it's helpful. Mm -hmm. But agree that in the world, we are afraid to give because it is yeah, so dangerous if the nurse is not get used to use it. Especially we are, if we do in a, a high care unit, it's okay. Maybe they usually get to use a pump, but, but in the world, I, I don't uh, recommend it. Okay, uh, may I add to this question? Uh, this was also the question from Dr. Bambang Tutuko. If you use it like continuously to the ward, mm. do you use it like as a single agent, only lidocaine plus simple analgesia? Or do you add something else to the uh, analgesia mixture uh, of your uh, analgesia regimen? Or what do you usually do for post-op pain? Only lidocaine or do you add something to it? Cecilo, what is your experience? Actually, I give paracetamol and NS8 as well. Okay. But no opioid anymore. Always you can, you, you have interest to use multimodal analgesia. Yeah, yeah. Combining, combining uh, different drugs, acting with, uh, at different... Uh, um, Site with, of action. Yes, yeah. the, the site of action. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, you both mentioned in your uh, presentations that this can reduce opioid use. I guess we can all agree on that. But we would like to know, do you have an experiment, experience where you can go totally opioid free? So intraoperatively only using lidocaine. Is that <laughs> possible, Professor? No. <laughs> what do you think? No. No. Okay, so we... Pair uh, the opioid. Yeah. What do you but think? we can reduce the opioid dose intraoperatively. Um, I totally agree with uh, with yeah. Cicillo. Uh, uh, probably is still uh, under um, is still under research, and uh, our aim is to reduce uh, the opioid consumption, but not not really uh, free. Impressed. <laughs> It's probably a little bit uh, uh, too much uh, to, but but certainly to reduce opiate intraoperative opiate consumption is uh, is interesting for the, the postoperative course. Okay, um, it's also an area to study of as well. I think. Yeah. Um, there's also a lot of questions here regarding other types of population that we haven't mentioned, pediatrics, neonates. Do you think it's possible that we can apply the same practice to pediatrics and neonates, Professor? What is, uh, sorry, pediatric, uh, pediatric cases. Children. Uh, children. Yeah. yeah. Pediatric. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> uh, there is uh, a lack of uh, data on the pediatric population. 
um, we, we, we do not uh, perform pediatric population in my institution. I'm really not an expert. Uh, but um, uh, physician uh, taking care for uh, uh, pediatric patients uh, use the same regimen and uh, with, with similar results in, uh, in pediatric and with similar doses uh, corresponding to the weight of the, of, the, of the patients. But I have not, no personal expertise. What do you think, Dr. Susilo? Uh, have you tried it? Accord yes. According to the literature, baby six months, eight and older, have a possibility to use lidocaine intravenously without any risk of uh, toxicity and so on. So, but the dose seems that it is little uh, smaller than adult dose. Like they said, one, 1 1.5 bolus, 1 1.5 uh, uh, drip. Okay. So it's something that we can um, try to practice, but do it cautious, I think, because we lack data in this yeah, uh, yeah. area. Especially okay, for pediatric. Questions, yeah. Yeah. Even more so for neonates, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because our margin of safety would be very much uh, reduced there. Mm. Uh, there are several questions regarding neuroanesthesia. Uh, Moving on to Dr. Susilo, there is a case here shared by Dr. Untung. A craniotomy uh, and patient is unstable hemodynamically, also has some history of valve, uh, cardiac valve replacement. Uh, do you think that if we give IV lidocaine, will it interfere with the hemodynamics? Uh, if we want to do IV lidocaine, do we need to reduce the dose or how, how do you think we should incorporate I feel I okay in this case. Okay, my my answer is uh, like this. I think, like we do it in enhanced recovery after C-section. First, it's better to do in a good case, in a safe case. Please don't give lidocaine in like this case because we don't know yet about the the best those how to use it when to stop when to start after this is already in our uh, hand then we can do for severe case like dr untung said that's my answer okay do you have an opinion about this uh professor bossier i totally agree no, no. okay uh, I guess we have talked a lot about the, the happy effects of lidocaine. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the experiences that we should be cautious of. We learned that we should be careful in patients with beta blockers and stage renal disease and stage liver disease. Um, what, uh, in your experience, have you ever experienced a uh, bad clinical experience with lidocaine, for example? Uh, local anesthetic toxicity, there are several questions about that, or uh, too much dose when you combine with regional anesthesia, do you have any uh, bad experience with this and uh, how to uh, prevent this, Professor? Um, the, the only bad experience I have had with uh, IV lidocaine was related to um, uh, 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 misleading use, um, uh, an, uh, a mistake of uh, drugs between uh, two uh, <clears throat> uh, two conditioning uh, of uh, of the product and uh, a mistake in drug dilution, mm. and we we put ten ten fold the usual dose. Wow! And obviously, okay. obviously. Um, uh, we we have uh, uncontrolled uh, uh, toxicity and uh, and and sign a clinical sign of uh, of toxicity, but uh, uh, but uh, without uh, any uh, long term detrimental effect, the, the patient had seizure uh, at the induction, and uh, it was uh, it, it was just uh, um, uh, an error, 
And that's why we have to emphasize that uh, you always have to, to be very careful when preparing uh, like, uh, IV lidocaine infusion. And uh, we ask pharmaceutical company uh, to provide us with, uh, uh, with good conditioning uh, to avoid, to, to, to have some dilution to make. Okay. But no, we no. usually, uh, do you usually use the, the, the standard one, uh, the 2% one? Yes, but uh, in this case, in the, in the, in the case I, I have reported, uh, it was uh, uh, the zero count of 5%. Five okay. I have an experience no, once, no. yeah, that maybe it is will not happen again to you that you use it the, on the first time. I give a bolus too fast. There is a, because anesthesiologists usually give pop, pop, pop. We never <laughs> give it slow, it's very, so actually it's better if give it as a, a drip bolus, not not the, the single bolus injection. But yeah, that's the problem for us. So now I, I give a, a uh, to dilute so yeah by 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 the way it is takes time to 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 finish the bolus so that's the problem only then the patient said uh, tinnitus the metal taste but after yes. that never happen again because oh i know i give too fast okay, so we reduce the speed of the yeah bolus. yeah it's, it's very difficult for anesthesiologists to reduce the speed <laughs> Especially when you want to start the case. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there is a question here, quite interesting. So this uh, this doctor, he doesn't have a sitting pump in his uh, facility. He asked whether we can give intermittent boluses during the surgery. What do you think about this, Professor? So instead of drips, intermittent boluses. First of all, um, you have to know that uh, uh, probably the, the bolus is uh, sufficient for short-term mm. uh, procedure. Procedure lasting less than uh, uh, 30 or 40 minutes. Uh, you, 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 have not, uh, uh, you, you are not uh, really um, uh, obliged to, to use a, a continuous infusion. Continuous infusion should be uh, 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 reserved to uh, long duration uh, pressure. Uh, I have no experience with uh, repeated uh, bolus, but probably it's it's better to to make uh, repeated bolus than uh, to make uh, than to put the product in the infusion uh, uh, where you, you you can risk to to have an overdosage or uh, probably it's better to do this if you have not um, uh, pump. Okay, what do you think, Doctor Zasilo? I think if you don't have a syringe pump, it's better not to use it to make sure that <laughs> <laughs> you are not making dangers for your patient. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because if you give a intermittent bolus, then the, the, the dose is will be like this, not steady state on the same time. Right, right. I think this is important to know as well. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, that's very interesting. Hmm. Uh, probably it's more useful in the beginning or at the end before extubation. But yeah, yeah, in the middle, yeah, you're right. In the middle, probably not so much. So, okay. There is uh, another question about uh, neuroanesthesia, which I think needs to be highlighted. Uh, from Dr. Ugi, uh, he wants to know what you think is its effect on neuroinflammation, especially one that uh, uh, is connected to POCD. Have you an had any experience with this inflammation and POCD and how does lidocaine uh, affect this, Dr. Susilo? In very small study like I did, it's only 60 patients, I found no POCD. But in literature, they also mentioned in geriatric patient, it's helpful. 
the the number of VOCD is much better than placebo. I think there is a place of uh, lidocaine that works in neuroinflammacy that can reduce the POCD uh, possibility. Uh, what do you think, Professor? Uh, you're still muting. Yeah, I think you're muted. Okay. Sorry, I, I left the conference because of technical problems. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. I did not hear the question. Oh. You're uh, the, uh, the yeah. doctor was either um, giving lidocaine has any effect on neural inflammation and post-operative cognitive disorder, POCD. What do you think? Uh, there is there is some proof suggesting that it can be interesting, and I, I, I think Sutilo uh, uh, showed showed that uh, he, he, he obtained he, he obtained probably beneficial results uh, on, uh, on this, but this remains to be uh, firmly demonstrated. Okay. Like the slides that Dr. Susilo showed earlier, I believe, yeah. Uh, yeah. also mentioned about this, yes. In, in geriatric okay. case. Eh? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I think we should like uh, see more data into this before yeah. we know, because this is relatively uh, something that we recently just tapped into. There are quite a lot of questions here from people who conducts regional anesthesia and usually for regional anesthesia we give uh, not lidocaine but bupivacaine or ropivacaine uh, there are several questions asking if we combine uh, epidural with general for example and for the uh, epidural we give ropivacaine or bufivacaine and then intravenously we give lidocaine how do you think that they will interact with each other should we be cautious about this professor um, it's a very pertinent question but uh, unfortunately uh, it's very difficult to to answer this uh, this question because uh, um, uh, probably uh, it, it's it is demonstrated that uh, other local anesthetics such as BUP or uh, LBUP and ROP have uh, similar and even even more uh, uh, greater uh, effect uh, while given intravenously greater effects than lidocaine, but. The margin of uh, of safety is very low. That's very dangerous uh, product to give uh, intravenously. And uh, but probably uh, when when you do an epidural with a BUP, uh, <coughs> you have a, a systemic concentration of BUP that can be uh, interesting. My advice is 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 not to combine uh, both uh, both technique. It's we have no data that can be dangerous, and uh, and uh, and suddenly we, if your epidural is uh, uh, is okay, you you don't have uh, oh, you, yeah. you you don't you don't require to have additional analgesic effect. I have I have a good things yeah. that to to let us know that if you cannot uh, insert the epidural by so many things happen difficult or something then there is a study compare epidural and intravenous radiocaine the efficacy the effectiveness is just the same so if you are not lucky that can not insert the epidural don't worry, because lidocaine will help you at the same stage as uh, epidural. It's a very strong study as well. You're right. Mm -hmm. You're right, and this can be explained. Uh, it's it's very interesting uh, in the, to 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 mention uh, that, and that this can probably be explained because uh, uh, you know that uh, uh, even if uh, a very uh, ex experienced 
uh, arms, yeah. uh, eye is sometimes uh, failed yeah. sometimes, and uh, uh, but uh, uh, by opposite, contrary, uh, I, I will lidocaine is always working. <laughs> yes, <laughs> in favor of I feel lidocaine. That's probably in a large sample in a large population with an with an intent to treat. Uh, methodology, uh, you, you you have the same results, considering uh, failure. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, I think this will be our last question, given our time. But I think it's also important to address whether if the a patient is acute in acute pain. Uh, for example, in the recovery room, patient is in pain. Is there a place for IV lidocaine? Professor, what do you think for acute pain? Acute post-operative pain. Yes, acute post-operative pain. Yes, I think it's worth to try. Uh, yes, uh, uh, in uh, uh, with respect to contraindications, doses, it's worth to try. Uh, in, but always in combination in a multimodal approach of uh, analgesia, but it's certainly it was to try. Okay, what do you think, Dr. Susilo? You know, I cannot agree more. It's a very good answer. Okay, Did, we're going to use the same dose, something like uh, induction and then maintenance uh, as well for this acute pain condition? It's lower, lower. Okay. One milligram to one milligram as well. I think it's one enough. milligram, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I think we have discussed quite uh, from the pre-operative section until the post-op session. Mm -hmm. So if you allow me, I'll try to uh, give a, a conclusion towards what we have discussed today. Uh, I believe we learned quite a few uh, new insights to how to use uh, IV lidocaine in perioperative setting. We learned first from Professor Bossier uh, a lot of uh, good effects for it, other than it uh, improves recovery, it reduces opioid use, it prevents post-operative pain, and even uh, reduced hyperalgesia, uh, interestingly, uh, reduce chronic post-operative pain. Uh, there's also this, uh, effects in each organ in the lungs. It's also good cardiovascularly stable. Uh, interestingly, also antimicrobial. There were uh, several studies with two, uh, good effects for tumor surgery. Anti-inflammatory uh, as well. Anti-inflammatory as well. Which brings us to uh, Dr. Susilo's case, which <laughs> highlighted uh, its benefits for neurosurgical uh, surgeries. Uh, not only was it uh, good for the patient, but interestingly, it uh, provides uh, the, the sufficiency of the analgesia, uh, provides good operating condition for the surgeon as well. Uh, throughout the discussion, we also uh, mentioned several uh, conditions which where we should be cautious to use IV lidocaine, i.e. patient in beta blockers, um, heart blocks, patient with uh, end-stage renal and liver diseases, cautious in uh, hemodynamically unstable patients. But in most patients, we should be able to use it even when uh, uh, the patient is, for example, undergoing uh, regional anesthesia, but with caution. Um, is there anything else you want to add, Professor, as a take-home message for our audience? No, just uh, thank you for this uh, invitation. It was a, a pleasure. Uh, questions were very pertinent, very interesting. And just to say that uh, uh, I am available for uh, uh, another uh, another question. If uh, if people want to uh, to contact me for uh, uh, another, uh, I, I am available with with great pleasure. Thank you, thank you. It was great to have you. Dr. Susilo, concluding remarks? So just like uh, Mark said that, I just want to thank Guru of Lidocaine, Professor Mark Busse. You are great. You encourage us to have a good uh, medicine, the hidden treasure one. 
Thank you again. Hopefully we meet again after we do a three study and <laughs> deliver to the audience. <laughs> okay, I know. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Susilo. Thank you so much, Professor Mahbosia, for coming with us and explaining to us. Hopefully, this is beneficial for the anesthetic practice for everyone that joined our session today. I would like to return the floor to Dr. Krisha. Thank you very much. Good day, everyone. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Aino, Professor Mahbosia, Dr. Susilo. Thank you for giving your knowledge, sharing your experience, and using lidocaine. Uh, I think I already mentioned Dr. Mark Uche before during our practice session that this drug is relatively new to be used very operatively. However, thanks to you, uh, we have a lot, a lot of questions. I think more than 50, nearly 60 questions. Uh, I believe two hours is not enough, <laughs> yeah. uh, but we are very happy to have you with us. Dr. Susilo, thank you for sharing your experience as well in Indonesia, especially. And hopefully, maybe uh, if time permits, yeah, Dr. Susilo, next year, uh, we can talk more about uh, this new drug in Indo-Anesthesia. Uh, and I would like to thank also PT Mitsubishi Tanabe Pharma Indonesia for supporting this uh, webinar. And of course, stay safe, stay healthy, and see you on the next Indo Anesthesia webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.